you have a Bible, turn to <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, and I'll read down to the entirety of this chapter. So the, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid it, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered <clears throat> some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, <laughs> this is funny, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe, instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is without honor except in his own country and in his own house. He did not do many mighty works there because of their un belief, not that he couldn't, and he wouldn't, he did not. You know, it's interesting, we get to these last three parables, these picture stories that he gives us, you know, the hidden treasure now, and the, um, the, the pearl, the great pearl, the price, you know, and the, the dragnet, you know, these parables. You look at these parables, you say, well, who in the world understand these parables, you know? Well, I don't think the people that heard the parables understood the parables. Out of the seven parables, he only explains two of them. The sower and the seed parable and the weed and the tear parable. We have the Holy Spirit living in us and we don't understand this stuff. The disciples at this point, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. So when he's teaching these parables, they just say, uh -huh, oh yeah, mm-hmm. And then at one point they came, pulled them aside, said, Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? And so I'm sure as you go through these parables, most of us don't know what these parables really mean. And you can read them and you can get an understanding. There's a spiritual part of it. And I think the spiritual part, what I long for more than the agricultural part of it or the picture story, because I didn't live in that culture. I didn't understand all the agricultural things about what Jesus was saying to them specifically as they would have. They would have understood the agricultural part of these parables better than we would have, but we would understand the spiritual part of these parables better than they would because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. So there's a great parity between how they would have viewed this and how we read into these parables. And, you know, and he's going to say the kingdom of heaven. All, each, one of these, <clears throat> each one of these parables is going to start off with the kingdom of heaven is like. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven is. He says the kingdom of heaven is like. This is a picture. So he's trying to paint for his listeners and then he returns and goes back. By the time we get to verse 53, he'll go back to Nazareth. Why did he go back to Nazareth? We don't know. But we do know that could it be earlier? Remember earlier in chapter 12, while he was teaching, you know, and the multitudes and so forth. And it says his mother and his brothers, they stood outside seeking to speak to him. And one of the persons came and said, look, your mother and your brothers or standing outside seeking to speak to you, did he go back because he's a wonderful, loving Savior and a wonderful son 
to Mary and a wonderful big brother to all of his brothers and sisters. Could that be part of evoking him to go back to Nazareth? We don't know. But could it be that? But we, we do know that he's pe- teaching these parables because seeing they wouldn't see and hearing they wouldn't understand because the hearts of these people are dull. And so now he says in verse 44, again, you know, Matthew's writing him, Matthew's writing, you know, following Christ around. He's with Christ. He's writing these things now. He's with Christ. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure, <clears throat> excuse me, treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He says, the kingdom of heaven, 32 times he says that. Matthew also says six times, the kingdom of God. They are inexchangeable. The kingdom of heaven, you know, and here he says, it's like treasure hidden in the field. He's not, when people read parables that go to church, they think he's talking about church all the time. That's not true. He says, the kingdom of heaven, this is huge. The kingdom of heaven. He's not always specifically talking about the church. Here in this verse, he's not talking about the church at all. The church was never really called the treasure. We were never called his treasure. The only people that were called God's treasure, you read Malachi, you read um, Exodus 19.5, you read Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, and so forth. Psalm 35, verse 4, you read those verses. <clears throat> the only people that was called God's treasure was Israel. Israel was the only ones called God's treasure, not the church. We wasn't called his treasure. We were called his, you know, brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. You know, we, we called his, you know, his, his sheep in a sense, you know, the flock of God. We, you know, we, we called his disciples but they were really never called his treasure. We were never really called. We have a, uh, in, this earthen inve- in this earthen vessel we have, we have a treasure, but we were not specifically called his treasure. That's why <clears throat> this commentary is pointing to Israel, not to the church. It's not pointing to the church. Because he says, a treasure hidden in the field. Exodus says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. In Deuteronomy, he says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. He says that in Deuteronomy 7, 6. He says in Psalms, in the Psalms, Psalm 135, 4, the Lord has chosen Jacob, the synonymous with Israel, for himself, Israel for his special treasure. So the parable appears to be pointing to the nation of Israel and the, because the church was never defined as a treasure, and the nation of Israel was hidden away. Remember in AD 70, Titus Vespasian comes in Jerusalem, and he levels the city. As Jesus told his disciples, the disciples told Jesus, they looked at Herod's temple one day while they were standing outside. And they said, look at this great temple. It took 46 years to build. And Jesus said, you see that great temple there? Because Flavius Josephus said, if you, you never saw a temple unless you saw the Herod's temple. It was white. It was overlaid with gold at the top of it and so forth. Jesus looked at that temple and said, you see that temple? Not one stone will be left upon the other. And what happened, Titus and the Romans coming to Jerusalem, the Roman soldiers getting drunk and so forth, Titus up on the top of the embankment, this hill, you know, and one of the Roman soldiers falls back, throws his torch back in the temple. Titus on the top of the hill saying, no, no, don't do it. They thought he meant go, go, go. They burned the temple down. And when Jesus says not one stone will be left upon another, they burned it. But when they burned the temple, the gold melted between the slabs and it was lifting stone upon stone to get the gold. 
And then Israel was displaced all out through the world, mainly through Europe. They went to Europe. Some of them was doctors, scientists, you know, lawyers, um, gemologists, and all, you know, all types of different tr things they were skilled at. They were banished to Europe. They had came back to their own land. Look, no nation in the world was ever taken out of their own land, come back with their, in their land with their same language, and everything because the land in the eyes of God was always synonymous with the people. Unless they went into sin, he would take them out of his land, but he would bring them back. He told Jeremiah, this land I'm sending you out for 70 years, you'll come back. Titus Vespasian destroys Jerusalem in AD 70. Thousands of Pharisees crucified outside the city. And you would say, that's the end of Israel. You'd be, that's the end of Israel. Israel is done. There's no more Israel and all those guys who are preterists and those guys who love, you know, displaced theology and they replaced the church with Israel. They would be satisfied with that. But that is not the fact. Because 1878 um, years later, on May the 14th in 1948, Israel, David Ben-Gurion, Israel becomes a nation again. Israel becomes a nation again. The people come back to the land. When they come back to the land, they didn't know nothing. They had to learn how to be farmers, how to work tractor trailers and stuff. They knew nothing about none of those things. They had to till the land. Smart people. Say, well, how, they get, how did the Jews get all this money? They were smart people. And they came back into their land, Israel, the land of God. It's God's people land, the nation of Israel. They were hidden away from the world for 1,878 years. If you mind, it's A.D. 70 from 1948. That's about 1,878 years. No nation has ever come back to their land after they were displaced and taken out of the land. They always came back to the land. When the Syrians came and took them out of their place, you know, in 722 B.C., they taken out of the land. When the Babylonians came in 605 B.C., you know, and, and destroyed the city and burned down the temple, you know, they had the, the four, you know, they had, you know, when they were deported, the four deportations in 506, 605, rather, 598 and 597, um, um, and then ultimate 586, and then 582, they said there was some believe it was another deportation. They're taken out of their land, but they come back to their land. We know they always came back to the land because that's why we have the book of Nehemiah. They came back and built the land, built the walls. Ezra comes back in 458 B.C. To, for spiritual reform. And, you know, um, Zerubbabel, he comes back. And Zerubbabel comes back for, to build, rebuild the temple. The people saw the temple. Some of them were crying when they saw the temple. And some of them rejoiced. They always came back to the land, but they were a hidden people. They were hidden they were a hidden people. And here he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, that through his poverty you may become rich. Or Jesus hanging you know, on, you look at Hebrews, is looking, you know, at the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So most definitely this parable is speaking of, you know, not the church, but the, the nation of Israel was hidden, was that hidden field here. You know, because we were the ones that God said, no, 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 let your light so shine before men that, that you know, we are the light of the world, city is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. We should not be hidden. Israel was hidden. They were hit, tucked away for years, for, for years. It's amazing what God did for centuries. And then he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like, Notice, like a merchant, like a man merchant, not the pearl. He says, is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he, meaning the merchant man, had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
You know, one of the most expensive pearls in the world was discovered by this Filipino fisherman. And it was about 26 inches in measurement, weighed about 75 pounds, and gemologists estimate that the value of it was over $100 million. This great pearl. It says, this man found one pearl of great price and went and sold all that he had and bought it. The pearls were something that not the Jews dealt with. Jews didn't deal with pearls because pearls were something that the Gentiles coveted and that they longed for. They, you wouldn't see Jews with going after pearls because pearls were found in oysters. Oysters is in the family of crabs, clams, lobsters, shrimp, and so forth. They were non-kosher animals for Jews, according to the Torah. So a Jew wouldn't crack over a clam. They were forbidden to even touch or eat a clam. So all y'all that like shrimp and crabs and clams and oysters and mussels and all that stuff, eat on. <laughs> Just say your grace and enjoy it. But a Jew would never touch a clam. He wouldn't touch a clam or oyster. And nowhere in the Old Testament, you can go get a concordance and read till you go blind. Nowhere in the Old Testament will you even find the word pearl mentioned. There's nowhere mentioned in the Old Testament. Not even when you read about the breastplate of the high priest, it's interesting what he had in his settings of stones. It was four rows of stone of sardis, topaz, and emerald, and then the, you know, the other row was turquoise, sapphire, diamond, then it was jacinth, and um, agate, and, uh, and amethyst. You know, it, would, it, wasn't, it wasn't pearls, no pearls. I mean, of course, in Revelation, you know, the pearly gates. Everybody says, oh, you know, the pearly gates. But that's in glory. But they would never, a pearl only holds or keeps its value if it's kept in one piece. If you crack open a pearl and try to rip it apart, you, you, you would split the pearl, but it would be worth nothing. It would be worth nothing. Pearls were made with the, you know, the, the animal or the shell, the oyster, the oyster suffering pain. You have somebody ripping you apart and, and, and see how you feel. That's, that's what the pearl was, something that was ripped apart. The pearl was, you know, Jesus used it as a picture for the body of Christ, for the church. Because the church was persecuted like a pearl being ripped apart. Like the Gentile church. You know, we're, you know, look, three million Nero. Nero persecuted at least three million Christians, tortured Three million Christians murdered them, martyred them. He was so weird. He was a lunatic. He would ride around in his garden naked, screaming and yelling. He would, be, oh, you know, dug out these holes, place Christians in these holes, cover them with like tar or butanin, and light them with flame, and they would burn up, and he would run around yelling and screaming naked. He's the one that said, oh, the Christians are the ones who set Rome on fire, and he persecuted the Christians beyond measure. We're that pearl, the, the persecution of the church. Just like a pearl is formed inside of the oyster, the, you know, the church is that beautiful pearl that was purchased with the blood of Christ. But it's a lot of, look, we think of persecution in our culture, in the Western Hemisphere, a lot different do they think of, as they, well, how they think of persecution in the Eastern Hemisphere. We get a flat tie and say, man, this is nothing but the enemy, or this, this is warfare. Or you can't get your hair to go to a certain way. This is nothing but the devil, you know, or something. Ain't enough. I, they don't think of, you know, of warfare the way we think of warfare. And Jesus is the one who purchased this one pearl. You know, and it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Some people use this for an evangelistic kind of way of teaching. But this has nothing to do with evangelism. These are parables. You don't get theology out of parables in the sense like, you know, or doctrine rather, out of parables. You don't get doctrine out of parables. Jesus is making these picture stories. <laughs> People would be trying to kill themselves, trying to figure out, well, the kingdom of heaven is like, because I read a lot of commentaries. If you read some of the stuff I read and you look at some of the stuff that guys say, you're like, that doesn't make sense. And then some guys you read say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, no, this guy, nope, he's good up to this point. Or this guy is good 
when, you know, he's just focused on this portion, but the other portion, he's way, 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 way south, and he's getting too much of the school he went through, and you can see it th coming through his writing. You know, some of the guys, it's no, not, not like the Holy Spirit, is the school they were trained at, it comes through their writings. And here he says that, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Now, at this point, if you were one of the disciples, of course you know that Peter, you know, um, and Andrew, James, and John, at least those four, and Philip, the, they were fishermen. So at this point, they said, now he's talking, I'll talk. Now we kind of, now we know he's talking about a dragnet. Oh, we, we, he's speaking our language now. He's speaking our language now. He says, the kingdom of God is like a dragnet. And dragnet was used that for catching fish. You would take that net, it's this huge net. You, you'll see it if you go to Israel. One, guy, one group in one boat, one group in another boat, they would take that net and they would, you know, kind of slowly go you know, around the, you know, almost the floor of the Galilee Sea. The Galilee Sea is only like seven miles wide, 11 miles long, and at the deepest point is 150 feet. They would take that net and drag that huge net and whatever you caught, you caught eels and, you know, somebody threw their old sneakers in there or sandals or whatever in that day. And you would have everything. And you would take it ashore and you would take the fish out and put them in vessels. And the rest of the stuff, you would just get rid of it. And so this dragnet, he says, they cast this dragnet into the sea. And this is a picture of the nations of the world and gathered some of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, into vessels, but threw the bad away. And Peter and his crew understood this to some degree. Spiritually, I don't think they did. But on the surface, they did understand some of this. And we know that he's talking about something greater than fish. We know that he's talking about something greater than the church. We know that he's not talking about Israel. Or he's talking about something else because he says in verse 49, so it would be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth. They would be the ones almost carrying this dragnet. Separate the wicked from among the just, same way you would do when you went fishing. You took the good stuff and you took the bad stuff and you discarded it. Now the wicked here are those who are devoted to darkness. And this is the ones who would live more than likely through the tribulation period. Because look, you think about the tribulation period is real interesting. During the tribulation, the church is raptured before the tribulation, right? We believe that. We're pre-trib. Church is raptured. God ushers in seven years of judgment. Seven years. The first three and a half years, you have the two prophets mentioned in um, Revelation chapter 11. We believe it's Moses and Elijah. You have those two prophets. And those two prophets will do miracles and mighty wonders. And they'll be slaughtered, you know, put to death on national TV. We, when John wrote this, he said, how could everybody in the world see that? Oh, back then they didn't have Facebook and Instagram. And, but now we live in an age where somebody can see somebody around the world and the whole world can see them. And, and they would stand up and they would preach and so forth, wanting the people to repent. And, the, and they don't. They kill them. God calls them up. They leave them dead on the streets for three days. God calls them up. They stand up on their feet, calls them up to heaven. The set, the, in chapter 7 of Revelation, the 144,000, you know, junior Billy Graham Jewish, you know, evangelists, they will be proclaiming the, you know, the truth of God. Not one of them will be lost. They will be proclaiming the gospel. They will, I mean, the kingdom, in a sense, they will be preaching the truth. And we, we know that when they, that we'll see them in the Revelation 14 standing with Christ, they have a song nobody knows but the 144,000 in Christ. None of them perish, they're sealed. None of them gets martyred during the tribulation period. God is being gracious to a Christ-rejected world. When you get to Revelation 14, which is interesting, verses 6 and 7, you have the everlasting angel. The angel, one, it's three angels. The first one in verses 6 and 7 is proclaiming the, you know, the, 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 the gospel of the kingdom and so forth that people could get saved. And during the tribulation period, people will get saved. But it'll cost them their life. 
They won't be a part of the church, but they can get saved and they'll be in heaven. Then there will be those who live through the tribulation period. I believe they're all going to be believers and be ushered into the millennium kingdom when we come back and reign with Christ for a thousand years. But then it will be a group who will put their fists up to God. This is the wicked he's talking about. So I don't care. And they would blaspheme God, the God of heaven, it says. And that scorching heat, and you know, Revelation 16, and so, you know, the scorching heat, and they were blaspheming God. So, we don't care what you do. We, you, we don't care. This is the wicked he's talking about here. The angels will gather them like dragnet, put in a dragnet, and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. And we know that, you know, the false prophet. Yeah, and the Antichrist, they, they, they are going to try to run. <laughs> this is they're going to be running from God. Isn't that something? Be tracked down and thrown into the lake of fire alive. Never even says they stand before the, being, the, you know, the great white throne judgment. They'll be th thrown into the lake of fire alive, cast into the lake of fire alive. Alive. And so he says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire. That don't sound too happy, a good place to be. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth out of darkness. Hell is no place for nobody to go. People say, well, well, why would God send somebody to hell? No, people choose to go to hell. You choose to follow Satan and his fallen angels and live in sin and reject God's offer for the provision of your sin. People don't die and go to hell because of sin. They die and go to hell because they project, reject God's only provision for their sin. Christ, his shed blood, his life. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. None. And people die and go to hell. They do. And God will give every man, this is what people forget, nobody will be without excuse, as it says in Romans chapter 1, but God will give every man their fair share to have an opportunity to respond to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There will be nobody that said, well, I didn't know, Lord, I didn't, I didn't understand. No, everybody will be given the opportunity to understand that they are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Every man that's born will have, and woman born into this world has that opportunity. They will have that chance to make a choice. And you can make a bad choice or an intelligent decision to allow Jesus Christ to be your Lord and to be your Savior and to give your life to Christ. Not play religious games like the religious people would. And Jesus said to them, speaking to the disciples, verse 51, have you understood all these things? They said to him, notice, yes, Lord. I don't really believe they understood all these things. And they said, yes, Lord. They didn't have the Holy Spirit living inside them. They didn't fully understand these parables. So I doubt that they were fully telling him the whole truth. Matthew just records it here. But I doubt it. Because you, know, you know when you tell somebody something and they want to look smart? And so you understand that? So, oh, yeah, I understand it. As soon as you leave them, they run. What did he say? I don't know. I understand what this guy was talking about. Let me look it up. I think he said this. What did you hear what he said? Yeah, I'm sure they went through that. He said, do you? They said, yes, Lord. We, we, we understand. Jesus only interpreted two of the parables out of the seven to them. So you think they understood all this stuff? I doubt it very much. Because remember when, they, when Jesus asked him the question, who do you say that I am? He said, who do you say that I am? And then, you know, they said, some say Elijah. And, you know, they go through the whole thing, you know, some say, um, you know, Jeremiah and so forth. But he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter was the only one that said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turns around and looks at him and says, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And right after that, Peter said, Christ said, I'm going to the cross and be crucified. And Peter said, I forbid you not. And so all these things. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. For you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And here he says, do you understand these things? I should ask all of us the question here this morning. Do you understand all these things? And you know what y'all going to say? 
Some of them, not all of them. Do you understand these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, so since you said you understand these things, look what he says. Therefore, every scribe, and he's not talking about the scribes of the Pharisees, those type of scribes. You know, he, he's, it, this is in a good sense, a studied or a person that's learned, that one learns, you know, to be a scholar in a sense in regards to the word of God. This is therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven it's like a householder who brings out of his treasure, this is like a storehouse, things new and old. So Jesus is saying, since you say you understand all these things, know this, that the scribe of the kingdom of heaven has a treasure and has a storehouse and knowledge of the old and the New Testament. And God says, you know, and whatever we offer to this lost, lost, dying and decaying and sinful dark world, if it's not a treasure to us, it won't be a treasure to them. We should know the New Testament. We should know the Old Testament. We should know our Bibles. And if we treasure the word, how much more when the world hear us treasure the word and see us proclaim truth with passion? <laughs> and, you know, not just wondering if you believe. No, I believe that Jesus is the Lord. I believe that all the Old Testament points to the Messiah. I believe that the volume of the book is about Jesus Christ. All the prophecies, born of a virgin. You know, he would be born in Bethlehem. And, you know, the scepter would never leave his hand. All the prophecies from Genesis 49 and Genesis 3:15, and all through all the prophets that wrote about Christ. I believe those things. You come and say those things with authority. I believe those things things about Jesus Christ. You're not going to wear me down with your dark questions. I believe that he's Lord, that he was crucified and buried and rose from the dead. I believe that all those 13 letters or 14, if Paul wrote Hebrews, I believe that everything that he, you know, the Holy Spirit allowed these men who were moved by God to write, I believe they are the Holy Scriptures and nobody can change my mind. You go to a world like that, two things that happen. They say, he is really kooky. But on the other side, you'll be standing up just like Stephen stood up before the Sanhedrin. They said they could not resist his wisdom. And that we know the word in such a way that they can't resist our wisdom. And it is not even our wisdom, it's the word of God. But that we would be scribes, that we would be the ones that say, no, old and new, I got something from the old for you. You want to know that? I got something from the, that's why we teach the Old Testament on Wednesday nights. We teach the New Testament on Sunday nights. You have churches that say this. Well, why would you teach the Old Testament? That's the old, you know, dispensation. Or that's the old, you know, old administration. Or that's the Old Testament. Or that's the old covenant and so forth. I'm like, are you kidding me? What do you think the first century New Testament Christians read? The Old Testament. Because the New Testament wasn't formulated. What else do you think they re They read. When First Samuel this Wednesday night, I'm excited. And that we should be students of the word of God. You know, we should be those who diligently search the scriptures and say, no, 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 I know who my Lord is. You can't convince me. No counterfeit would ever make me believe anything other than what the Bible teaches. None. I'm convinced of who God is, and I'm, I'm convinced of who I belong to. I belong to Jesus Christ. And we belong to one another. Romans 12, 5, we belong to one another as the body of Christ. We belong to each other. We are a body. We should know the word of God. And here Jesus, after he gets done these parables, verse 59 says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. Matthew's probably following them around, right? And let me get some more of this stuff he's talking about. There's some good stuff here, Matthew. Matthew's probably saying when he had come to his own country, notice, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. People should be astonished at the truth we have. And said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Where did this stuff come? He didn't go to our school. He didn't go to our, sem our seminary or the cemeteries, some of them might be called. He didn't go to this place, that place. He didn't have all these letters behind his name, the TDH, the DDD. And they're looking at him. This is just a carpenter. We know him. He lives down the street. 
He on 23rd and Nazareth Avenue. He's a carpenter. Because God will use any of us to know his word. The book is open to everybody who wants to learn it. It's open for everybody. <laughs> he says that Jesus comes to his own country. You know, he's back in Nazareth. Remember the Bible says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? No, the greatest man to ever walk the face of the earth came out of Nazareth. And here it says, and when he had come to his own country, look, we realized like the last time when Jesus was in Nazareth, I'm sure, Remember when he said, he quotes Isaiah, says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel and so forth. And he looked at the people in the synagogue. He hand attended the scroll and he sat down. And when he sat down and, you know, and he began to say to them in front of all these people in the synagogue, he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They was like, what? Are you kidding me? He's, and, you know, and, and then they tried to kill him. Luke tells us when all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust them out of the city and led them to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And Jesus, passing through their midst, I'm sure supernatural, went his own way. The last time he preached a sermon in this place, they tried to throw him off the cliff. He says, today, these, this, he, with Isaiah, he's writing about me. This, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Now he comes back to the same people. Look, you, let me tell you something. You want to learn how to be sanctified? Start a Bible study with your own family. You, you know, people say, I got a teaching gift, okay? Start on with your own family. The people that know all your filthiness and all your lazy habits and all the things about you. And then you're going to come and say, yeah, I got a word for you. They're looking at you. Yeah, sure you do. You remember how dirty you used to keep that old room you had? That bring up all kinds of stuff. The first Bible study I ever taught was kind of at work, but it was almost simultaneously with my family on Friday nights. Rich was there. Remember, Rich? And you talking about persecution. Phew, y'all don't know nothing about persecution. And, and it was good because you learn the most because they know you. Anytime you try to say some super spiritual stuff, and God said to me, yes, yeah, sure, he said to you. And here Jesus goes back to his hometown. I'm telling you, that's the best training in the world. Teach your family. After they didn't see how your life was, and then you get saved. Because then they can see the, the cross, the burial and the resurrection of a person's life right before them. And you got the heavenly host behind you when, you when you proclaim God's word. And it never returns void, whether they receive you or, you know, re re reject you. It never returns void. God's word will never return void. Whatever God sent it out to do, that it will accomplish. It will never return void. Don't be afraid to go to your family and say, look, I think the Lord lead me to start a little study with y'all. And you watch what they say. Who do you think you are? Who, who, look, who made you holy than thou? Who, you look, are you trying to say, I got a sin problem? I'm saying you got a sin problem. Well, remember, uh, well, no, nope, I'm a new creation in Christ. He's all, oh, you're not a new creation in Christ. You're still smoking. But I'm born again. You know, people say, they smoke and they're a Christian. I can't Christian smoke. You can't be saving smoke. It's not like the Holy Spirit down in your stomach said, cut it out. He choking me out. No, Christians can struggle with things that they've been delivered from and they grow into. But when you're ready to do that study, get rid of all those other things. So they can't accuse you of nothing. And you can say, at least three of y'all here going to do a Bible study. And they'll look at you and say, who do you think you teach it? I experienced that. Well, who do he think he is? Now, all of a sudden, he's Mr. Righteous? I said, no, I'm not Mr. Righteous. I'm right with God. And Jesus comes to town. Was it like they had this red carpet rolled up for? Here he comes. No, they didn't. He comes in town. I'm sure it was discreetly. You know, he had come to his own country. He taught, in them, he taught them in their synagogue. 
so that they were astonished and said, where did this man, they got a problem here, get this wisdom and these mighty works? They had the same problem that Nicodemus had. They said, where did this man, this wasn't a man, this was God clothed in human flesh. When Nicodemus said, we know that you're a man who came from God. No man can do these things unless they, you know, they come from God. And, and, and Jesus looked at him and Nicodemus hit it all wrong. No, he was talking to God in human flesh. That was the problem, the heavenly scholar. And then they said, you know how to bring up your past where you came from. Is this not the carpenter's son? Joseph is probably dead at this point. They don't mention his name. Is not his mother called Mary? You know, uh, the Talmud said that Mary had Christ out of fornication. That's why when Jesus get into that heated debate with the religious leaders, the Pharisees, in John chapter 8, they said something real interesting that most people don't realize. They said, oh, we know who our father is. Saying that, oh, you were born of fornication. And Jesus said, yeah, you, I do know who your father He's the devil and the father of all lies. This was a hot, heated moment. He said, I know my father. I know your father. He's the devil. And here it says that, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? The Catholics don't like this part of the Bible, I'm sure. And his brothers, James, Joseph, who would have been another name for Joseph, Simon, Judas. Now, James, who was the oldest next to Jesus, Judas is Jude, who writes the book of Jude. James is the one who writes the book of James. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ because in John 7, 5, it says even his own brothers didn't believe in him. And here they say, oh, we, we, they knew his whole family. And it says, and his sisters, how many sisters? Was it 10 sisters, five sisters? We don't know. It's plural, sisters. So we know he at least had two sisters. Are they not with us? In other words, don't they live in our town? Where did this man get all these things? These are the two verses the Catholics misquote. They hate it. Because they try to attempt to have, you know, keep Mary in a place of perpetual virginity. That she's a virgin, the virgin Mary. She never had another man. It was just Jesus came to her supernatural. Well, they read these verses. Sorry, I got it all wrong. You know, Mark says when he writes about Jesus, he says, Is not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brothers of James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon, are not his sisters with us? So they were offended at him. So these two passages record that Jesus, both Matthew and Mark, Jesus indicates that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary at this point had at least seven kids. Jesus, his four brothers and sisters, it's plural, it was just two of them, it's at least seven kids. So there's no perpetual virginity here. She's not a virgin forever. She was sitting in that same upper room. When you read the book of Acts, most people don't realize this. When you read Acts, it's an interesting verse in there that talks about Mary. When it says in Acts chapter 1, it says, These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So that means that Mary was the, the same person she gave birth to, the same son, the son of God she gave birth to, was the same son of God she needed to be saved by. The same one she birthed was the same one that was her savior too. And she knew that to some degree. I'm sure she didn't know all of it neither. She stood at the cross, you know, Jesus says, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother, you know, and so forth. See, when the, you know, the first miracle, he says, do as he says, you know, when he turned the water into wine. Mary understood some things. You know, an angel came to her. I'm sure she understood some things. When you read the Magnificat, she, she understood some things. But here it says that, you know, the, that here, you remember when John, John wrote in the Gospel of John, John says, after this, he went down to Capernaum. This is how we know that he had brothers and sisters. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. After he did the, you know, the, you know before the water and wine and so forth, before that miracle, they went together, says his mother, his brothers, they went down to that wedding feast. They went there. 
So he has sisters and brothers, my brothers in Catholicism. And it says that Jesus, it says that so they were offended at him. They were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not with honor except in his own country and in his own house. The closest people you may share with and teach or whatever, they get so familiar with the teaching, they don't even appreciate it no more. So many pastors teach year after year, and everybody gets so too familiar with the word of God and they get familiar with the man. They forget that it's the word of God. And he could be teaching the flock for years. Turn, turn, turn. And one guy could come one week that I didn't see in years and say, man, that guy had the greatest sermon ever. ever. He told us to repent, and we're going to do it. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that something? And here in your own town, sharing the truth, you will, people will be offended at you. Do you realize that? They were offended at Christ. They'll be offended at us. We're not greater than our teacher. If the world hated him, John 15, the world will hate us also. Do you realize that? So they throw you out. It says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Not here on earth. Great is your reward is in heaven. When you get persecuted, you say, yeehaw. Thank you, Lord. I'm partaking in the sufferings of Christ, as they said in the book of Acts. They rejoiced. It says, now he did not do, notice, it says, now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It doesn't say he couldn't or he did, and it didn't say that he didn't do any, but it says, but he did not do many mighty works there. He didn't say any, he did some. Look, just the teaching of the word of God was mighty works. Because all the, you know, People that day, they were scribes saying they would quote from, you know, Shimei said this, Akaba said this, this, you know, this, I mean, rabbi said this and that. They wouldn't quote scripture. They was quoting from what somebody else wrote. And here it says, a prophet is, is without honor except in his own country and his own house. You go somewhere, some pastors, they said they go preach out. He said the people, when they preach out, receive them better than the people that they preach into. Isn't that something? It's amazing how that happens. I'm not talking about me. I'm not trying to make y'all feel bad or nothing. I'm just saying some guys say that. I didn't say that. Amen? All right, let's stand up as we pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for how much you love us, Lord. Pray for that person, Lord, trying to figure these things out, Lord, in the flesh, Lord. Spiritually discern, Lord, your word, the truth of your word. We'll stand before you, Lord, blameless one day, Lord. We'll stand before you encouraged. We'll stand before you lifting up the name of Jesus. We'll be worshiping you, Lord. The things that was once dim, Lord, they will be made so clear. And we'll see you face to face. We can't wait until you return back. No rainy days in heaven. We will need not the S-U-N because we'll have the S-O-N. He'll illuminate the whole entire world, the new heaven and the new earth. And so, Father, we thank you for being so great to us and so good to us and loading us with daily with benefits. We honor your holy name. We pray in the name of Christ. We pray, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning if you love the Lord.